All right, we're gonna read chapters two and three of Ashes. Um, we left off at a big cliffhanger with the rattlesnake and the soldiers aiming to shoot the rattlesnake right where Isabel is hiding, I think, I believe. That is what happened at the end of chapter one. Let's see what happens next. Chapter two. This is from the journal of Colonel Henry Dearborn of the Continental Army. I ate part of a fried rattlesnake today, which would have tasted very well had it not been snake. I did not breathe near as long as I was tall and thick as my arm. The yellow eyed snake stared at me, tail rattling, tongue flickering like flame. I could, <clears throat> excuse me, I could not move. There were other noises, other dangers that needed my attention. Shouts, thunder, footsteps, but I couldn't look away from those terrifying eyes. A rattlesnake's bite meant death, or at the very least, the need for amputation before the poison made it way to your heart. The worst place to be bitten was the face, for there was not much point in the amputation of a head. The only saving grace of a rattlesnake was that the creature gave fair warning. The vigorous shaking of the rattle on the end of the tail alerted the victim not to come closer. <clears throat> the way a port city might send a cannonball over the bow of a ship, pirate ship straying too close to shore. It announced that a further advance would be met with swift and fatal punishment. The only thing worse than the rattling of the snake's tail was the moment the tail fell silent, for then the creature would strike. The snake before me slowed the shaking of its tail, but did not stop. The dull sunlight reflected off the dark brown scales ornamented with diamond-shaped patterns in black and white. If I could move fast enough, there was a small chance I could leap up and away from its reach. But if I did that, the soldiers would seize me in an instant. The snake measured the panic in my face. I saw something, I tell you, one soldier insisted, moving between the trees. Blasted moss flapping in the wind, flapping in the wind, replied another. Quit acting like a wee bairn, a ferret of hunts and ghosties. Two black butterflies, their wings dotted with splashes of sky blue and pumpkin orange fluttered by. They paused for a moment on the log, their wings opening and closing like bellows, then twirled away. As they departed, the snake lowered its head to the ground and slid under the log. It did not cease rattling its tail until it disappeared from sight. Before I could move away, the sharp report of rifle fire cut through the air. I peered over the log. The guard lay on the ground, clutching his bloody shoulder and screaming. The British were hollering above the cries of their friend, arguing about where the shots had come from as they scrambled for their muskets and cartridge boxes. Heavy boots thudded from the forest behind me, then militiamen in long hunting shirts and dark breeches ran past, skirting both sides of the hollow where I lay. They took up their positions behind the broad trunks of old oaks and ancient pines and knelt to load their, load their weapons. Most carried muskets, but a few possessed the deadly rifles of the mountains. This was warfare in the Carolinas, fierce battles betwixt patriot militia groups and the redcoats who fought alongside local loyalists. Everyone was fighting for freedom, but few could agree on the meaning of the word. Prepare, screamed a redcoat. The militia roared in defiance. Huzzah, ready. The British snapped their muskets up to their shoulders and pulled back the hammers that held their striking flints. <clears throat> now, screamed a long haired man clad in buckskin. The militia stepped out, out from their trees and fired. The British fired at the exact same moment. The explosion of so many guns sounded like a fierce volley of lightning bolts. The British soldiers dragged the wounded guard off the road and quickly formed a half circle to protect him while preparing for the next volley. The air filled with shouts, screams, men from both sides being ordered to load, aim, and fire. The woods to both sides of me exploded for a second time. Bullets flew across the road, some headed east, some west, shredding leaves and thudding into tree trunks. Another voice cried out in pain. The screams of the injured guard were weakening. More footsteps ran past me. How many militia were there? How long before one of them found me? Was Curzon captured, killed? My nose twitched with the metal tang of gunpowder. I didn't dare move, but couldn't stay. A stray bullet spung over my head like an angry hornet. Mayhaps I could back away from the scene, slow like a hand suddenly covered my mouth and another gripped my wrist and pinned it to the ground. Curzon threw himself to the dirt next to me. Don't move, he warned. I pushed away his hand, but for once was not inclined to argue. Did they see you? He shook his head. 
They only have eyes for the red coats. How many, I whispered, not sure. The noise of the skirmish changed in tone. The shouting quieted. Two guns fired, one right after another, but it sounded as if they were farther away. The wounded guard had stopped screaming. We looked at each other, gave a nod, and silently counted to 100, as was our custom in unsure circumstances such as this. By the end of the count, the woods had fallen silent. The gritty fog of gunpowder smoke drifted away. We crawled until we could peek around the opposite ends of the log. In the distance, the militiamen were chasing the British patrol south down on the road. The guard's body lay still by the fire. It did not have enough of a eye, did not have enough of a view to see if there were any more wounded lying about or worse, any militia waiting to shoot at stragglers. Curzon's view must have been blocked too, for he gave his end of the log a small push. The rattlesnake did not like did not take kindly to having its hidey hole disturbed. It coiled in tight loops and raised its head, hissing fiercely, its stiff tail shaking a dire warning. The head bobbed side to side, fangs displayed, its eyes level with Curzon's. He became still as a statue carved from rock. The tang of gunpowder, the buzz, buzz of bullets, the threat of a deadly snake, these awaken all of the senses at once with a powerful ferocity. 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 I could hear the retreating boot steps of the men, smell the blood stench of the dead soldier, see the pattern the snake wove in the air as it prepared to kill. I tasted fear. My left hand, out of the snake's sight, felt for the hatchet in my belt. I fumbled with the leather tie that kept it secured, then slowly pulled it free. I shifted closer to Curzon. The snake noticed. It turned its head to me and shook its rattles faster. I gripped the hatchet. Curzon scratched at the fallen pine needles with his fingers, diverting the snake's attention and giving me the advantage. The snake opened its jaws. With all the fury I could muster, I brought the hatchet down onto the serpent, cleaving its head from its body with one blow. I pulled the blade free from the dirt and chopped again and again until at last Curzon grabbed my arm and I stopped, panting. You've killed it three times over, he said. I spat on the remains. Snakes vex me. Way to go, Isabel. Chapter three, uh, memories of Boston King who fled slavery to join the British army. I was born in the province of South Carolina, 28 miles from Charlestown. My father was stolen away from Africa when he was young. I was going to kill it, you know, Curzon prodded a bit of chopped snake belly with the toe of his boot. I was going to smash it with a rock, I shrugged. I should have been giddy with delight about my victory over the creature and the fact that our enemies had chased each other away from this place. We had again cheated death and soldiers, but instead of being joyful, I felt weary and strangely out of sorts. <clears throat> you seemed determined to do the killing, Curzon continued, crouching to admire the sharp fangs of the snake. So I let you. You let me. I absently reached to pick up a bit of the snake's body. Curzon stayed my hand. What are you doing? It's dead, I stared at him. We should cook it later, once we find a safe spot. It will rot in this heat before we can cook it, Isabel. We'd both be sickened. He was right, of course. It was a common, um, a commonsensical notion. The king of, a, um, the kind of thing a child would know. Why had I not thought of it? He studied me close. Are you feeling addled? I gave my head a small shake, trying to clear the clouds from my brain pan. Nay, just hungry. I'll see if the fire spared us any rabbit, he said. You investigate that stone and figure our course. Soon we're gone from here, the better. We crossed the road, keeping eyes and ears open for the approach of any man or beast. Curzon approached the smoldering cook fire and the body of the dead soldier. I made for the milestone that had been our reason for coming to this place. We'd spied on any number of Carolina plantations in the weeks previous, careful to stay out of sight, but close enough to watch how the work was done. Occasionally, when the circumstances were secure, we visited the cabins of the enslaved people at night, befriended a few folks, and learned of the news of that place and the other plantations nearby. We were not the only ones making our way across the state by moonlight. The upheavals of the war had given many stolen people the chance to liberate themselves. Some were searching for kin like us. Others were seeking a safe spot of ground they could call their own, a place where they could be the master of their own body and soul and live without fear. All of us who wandered thus owned only the clothes on our backs. We relied on our wits to keep us fed. We traded information like coin. We shared stories about where clean water could be found, which places promised rest, and which had certain peril. That was how we'd made our way to this godforsaken spot. 
the last woman we'd spoken to before we became lost in the swamp had told me to seek out this very same milestone. The sea green flecks of moss growing at its base showed that it had long stood, stood there. More moss grew in the letter C for Charleston that was deeply carved into its face, as well as the number 12 and the arrow that pointed south, indicating that Charleston lay only 12 miles in that direction. Charleston had been our goal for years because the Locktons owned a fine house there, in addition to the rice plantation called Riverbend and the New York mansion where they'd held my sister and me in slavery. I'd convinced myself that Ruth had been sent to the Charleston house to work in the kitchen. Even though she'd been a sickly child, she was raised to do the heavy work of the scullery and larder. But Charleston was under rule of the King's army, as were New York and Savannah. Weeks earlier, we'd learned that anyone in Charleston who was not white-skinned was required to carry a British Army certification, proving the who's and why's and how's of their being. I'd easily forged our free papers the winter we lived above the printer's shop in Baltimore in a fit of hopefulness. I'd even composed one for Ruth as well. But I had no notion of what a British Army certification would resemble. Without the proper papers, we'd be snatched up soon as we set foot in Charleston. The scar on my cheek made me unfortunate easy to identify and I'd be in bondage again. Ruth, I reminded myself, find Ruth. Curzon searched through the pockets and haversack of the dead soldier and took a clipped bit of silver coin and twists of gunpowder from his cartridge box. The gunpowder was of more use to us than the gun itself, which would be a heavy burden and useless without lead shot. He held up the man's pocket watch, one eyebrow raised in question. This is worth a great deal if we could find someone half honest. I shook my head. We dare not. We'd been hoarding coins, both British and Spanish, for the journey homeward, but being caught with a watch such as that could be a disaster. Curzon nodded in reluctant agreement and replaced it in the man's waistcoat with a sigh. <clears throat> Any rabbit, I asked. Not much, he admitted, but we could boil the bones. I ran my fingertips over the number that told the distance to Charleston. Though it pained me greatly, we had to walk in the opposite direction to Riverbend. It would be much safer to first seek word of Ruth there than in a city controlled by the British. Curzon shouldered his haversack. Which way? The woman said north and northwest from here, I said. If we keep the Cooper River to our right, we ought come upon the place before dawn. All right, we're gonna stop there. We'll talk about it in person on Monday for those of you coming back to Star King. Um, distance learners, we will talk about it on Monday in our Zoom session. Um, I hope you all have a good weekend and I will see you on Monday.